Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to our webinar hosted by Feedonomics. We're joined by guests from Avalara and BigCommerce. This is what to consider when adopting an omni-channel strategy. Um, as I said before, this is being recorded. At the end of the webinar, we'll give you a copy of this recording as well as a copy of the guide. And if you have any questions, please use the chat or the Q&A function and we'll answer your questions at the end. Um, so I'm Mario Waddell, I'm the Content Marketing Manager from Feedonomics, and I'd like to introduce to you Sharon from Big Commerce. Thanks for having us here, Mario, really excited. Uh, my name is Sharon Gee. I'm the Vice President of Revenue Growth at uh, Big Commerce, and I'm the General Manager of the Omnichannel Partnerships Practice, which means uh, the team that I manage, we, we support partner management for all of the channels that a merchant might want to sell on. So Google, Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Pinterest, TikTok, Snapchat, Mercado Libre, all the channels that somebody might want to list their products on or pull orders in from. Uh, and then we also manage a uh, Omni-certified technology and agency partnership practice. So if you're a partner who supports any of the uh, merchants in their omni-channel strategy, we'd love to work with you. And, uh, and then we support a, an omni-channel consulting practice that is free, provided to merchants on any platform to be able to support helping their omni-channel uh, growth goals. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Sharon. And I'd also like to introduce Luke from Avalara. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mario and the Feedonomics team for having me here today. Um, my name is Luke Yamnitz. I head up the FinTech and Point of Sale Partnerships portfolio and strategy at Avalara, a leading provider of tax compliance automation for businesses of all sizes. Before joining Avalara, I spent a handful of years at an order management system ISV company, which powered enterprise omnichannel brands like New Balance, Build-A-Bear, and Yankee Candle. But my OG background is actually in advertising strategy, which is why I'm most drawn to see Omnichannel as more than just the operational extensibility of your product catalog or inventory locations. Really, the fruit of Omnichannel is an ever-consistent brand experience of choice for your customers. And I'm looking forward to diving more into that with you and Sharon today, Mario. Thank you, Luke. Uh, so when we talk about omnichannel, it seems that people often have a different definition of omnichannel. So for Sharon, why do you think that is? And what is your definition of omni? Yeah, I love, I love the guide you guys have put together. So Feedonomics has authored this amazing guide around kind of demystifying omnichannel and strategies that you can execute. So a lot of the content we're covering today is, is from that guide that, that Luke and I were able to contribute to. Luke, it's good to talk to you. We're in a different vest today. Uh, love that. Um, Luke and I have worked together for years. So, so fun to see you here. Um, the question, what is, how do you define omnichannel and versus multi-channel? I think in a post-COVID world, what we what we found is that having a channel strategy that allows a merchant to seamlessly manage the products that they want to list, no matter whether they're listing them on an advertising channel that is driving traffic back to their direct to consumer, whether they have those products in a store connecting their online and their offline experience for use cases such as buy online pick up in store, buy online return in store, um, as well as being able to list those products to various different third party channels, be they advertising third-party marketplaces like Amazon or Walmart or Target Plus, as well as um, making sure that you have a seamless experience that connects products, inventory, and order sync to your systems. Uh, I think the definition of omnichannel versus multi, people used to say omnichannel was just the online to offline experience connectivity where you're delivering a shopper experience that's easy. Um, what we found in, in multi-channel retailer is that uh, retail is that there's a lot of different teams that are siloed who are managing individual channels where it's not harmonized around what the customer is doing across each of these various different channels. So when we contemplate omnichannel strategy, it really is how does a merchant offer the things to a shopper that they need in order to answer four very easy questions. Is this the product that I want? Is it available near me? How much will it cost? And when will it be delivered? And that's no matter what kind of shopper it is, a B2B shopper, a B2C shopper, whether that's an in-store experience where you're making sure that they have that information and the various different, maybe you want to be in store, but you don't have the right size. You want to be able, able to be shipped that product from a warehouse or another store. That experience of seamless omni-channel journey for a shopper is really what we mean when we talk about an omni-channel retail strategy. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Luke. On a similar note, um, I've heard many people use multi-channel and omni-channel sort of interchangeably. Maybe sometimes omni-channel is like the evolution of multi-channel. 
How would you describe what the differences are between these two strategies? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I didn't need those four years of Latin in high school to know that omni uh, means all. We, you know, we're probably familiar with that. Uh, and Sharon just did a great job of really defining, you know, uh, some of that difference between multi and omni. Um, what I'll say is I would see omni-channel as the multiplying of front-end selling and the back-end fulfillment. Leveraging, as Sharon said, leveraging what you have available or exploring what you need to introduce, assuming that there's more than one on both end and not just focusing front end, not just focusing back end, but finding the right optimization for efficiency and consistency across both. Nailing that is extremely difficult and complex and in most cases will require some sort of order management engine or function to seamlessly expose all available inventory, no matter where it's located on the back end, be it in warehouses that you might uh, you know, own or control, 3PLs, you might leverage, brick and mortar stores, and then um, properly account for and route those orders based off of which rules are smartest, optimal, or chosen by the customer in that instance. So looking at that multi-channel graphic on the right, we can see that the path is restricted to a one-to-one -one linear only ratio, both with the customer data and experience, but also with the fulfillment path and likely siloed view of inventory. So an omni-channel selling strategy versus multi um, would have more of a centralized stack for this data, this flow to streamline operations before, during, and after a purchase, which we'll talk more about that today. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, we'll definitely cover a lot of the tech stack that Luke is talking about right now. Um, so Luke, this is also for you. Why should businesses adopt an omni-channel approach. Um, I guess, what does it allow you to do or what are some of the new experiences you may be able to create? What are the advantages to doing this? Yeah, um, absolutely. So why should it be adopted? Um, extending where your products or services are findable and sellable based off of where your target audiences want to find you, of course, can exponentialize your sales opportunities in the most opportune moments of customer intent influence, and convenience. This is, going back to the tech stack side of things, ultimately powered with efficiency, accuracy, and consistency by back-end omni-channel technology that exposes that full inventory view, does that smart routing, maintains a single source of truth for an order so it can be sourced or serviced by your teams throughout an entire order lifecycle, which could even mean a return or an exchange no matter which channel the sale occurred on. So breaking that down, why should it be adopted here, you know, are, are a few points to that. One, operational efficiency and being able to move your inventory faster. Two, potential cost savings in smarter shipment routing based off of geolocation or consolidation of items in an order. More choice for customers. So who can buy uh, online and pick up in store? They could ship to store. They can even buy in store and ship to home or even have input in the checkout process on how quickly or in what way they wanna receive those packages. Um, think of Amazon Prime and the Prime delivery date, that you have the option to say, I wanna get the packages faster and I don't care if it comes in four different boxes, just get them to me as quickly as possible, or being able to make the more economical, environmentally conscious choice to say, you know what, I can wait for Prime delivery day on Wednesday or whatever it is. Go ahead and save all of those um, items and ship it at once. And generally, a business adopting an omnichannel strategy is going to be making those decisions based off of, you know, the profit opportunity. Um, but it's also really fun to see how you can extend that again to customer choice to give them that option. And then finally, ultimately, it comes down to customer satisfaction and experience. You're giving them choice. You're available to sell inventory is accurate, meaning you have less canceled orders. That's one of the most frustrating things as a consumer is when you place an order and you get that email a day or two later saying, we canceled your order. And if you're lucky, they said that it's because they don't have the inventory, but generally you have to call in and track down why was this canceled. Um, so less of those, you're extending to more places, you're able to be found and be delighting your customers um, where they are most likely to be found. They can buy anywhere, return anywhere without headache because their order is centralized within your understanding and ideally connected to your CRM where there's a single view of them as a, in a, a, a customer for more personalized, ongoing maintenance and recommendations. Um, and we'll talk, uh, of course, about that in the, in the coming slides as well. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Sharon, in the guide, you touch on the importance of streamlining and unifying your operations as well. 
Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the importance of that, especially to the modern consumer? Um, you know, what are the expectations today? Yeah, if you're a shopper, and uh, we've got some great stats on the slide here that talk about how, um, you know, 57% of consumers are saying that they're shopping exclusively on third-party marketplaces. Um, we also know that uh, from research um, that, you know, over up close to 60% of conversions in, in digital retail is actually happening on third-party marketplaces. And so from an operations perspective, if you as a merchant are not making it possible for those who are originating search or shopping predominantly on third-party marketplaces uh, to be able to buy your products, under to see them, discover them, and, and receive them, uh, you're going to be missing out on your growth opportunities in these, in these fast-growing areas. And so um, making sure that you are contemplating and can operationalize a strategy that delivers a seamless shopper experience is really important. I'll give you an example. If a merchant is shopping on Amazon, but you aren't listing any products there, um, it's probably a pretty surefire bet that your competitors are listing. If you are a well-known brand, your competitors are either uh, listing products or your uh, those who sell your products might be reselling them. And so as an example, making sure that you have an easy way, if you are fulfilling products directly uh, fulfilled by merchant or uh, figuring out how you can have a strategy that allows you know, certain SKUs to be able to be listed on products in order to capitalize on that net new customer acquisition is going to be really important. And making sure that you can seamlessly sync the, the, the SKUs within your catalog that you want to that are relevant for that channel, and then seamlessly uh, ensure that you keep your inventory and your orders in sync between the systems that actually fulfill your orders is going to be really important. Uh, and so, because if you have the same, only one pile of inventory and you list those products across multiple channels and you don't have integrated uh, operations solutions, sending real-time inventory to those channels or near real-time, uh, you risk overselling, which can create some really, uh, you know, problematic experiences for a shopper on a channel if you uh, aren't sending accurate inventory information on a place that you're listing your products. Um, it, it also can mean you, you know, uh, with enough of those mistakes where you don't have that product to be able to actually fulfill, it can negatively impact your relationship with the channel that you're selling on. Um, and so making sure that you have a way to, number one, identify what SKUs you are putting on, you know, which, which components of your catalog are you merchandising on third-party channels, either ads or marketplaces. And that might be based on um, unit economics of that, of that product on that channel. And then making sure that you have a way to seamlessly keep in sync your products, inventory, and orders that you're sending to those channels is really critical in order to be able to support an omni-channel strategy. For example, if you want to be able to um, list a product on your direct-to-consumer site, but you want to be able to fulfill it from a uh, storefront, let's say, for example, you have a California store and a New York City store, and you don't have that available in California, but you do have it available in New York, you need to be able to have systems that can surface that available inventory on your direct-to-consumer if you want to be able to use your stores as fulfillment uh, or warehouse inventory that can fulfill orders. So this is, these are just a few examples of how to deliver a seamless shopper experience that meets uh, omni-channel shopper expectations and why having operations um, and tools and systems integrated to be able to support those use cases is obviously an important part of this strategy. Thanks, Sharon. So um, I like how you're pointing out that sometimes we're talking about um, using your storefronts or your warehouses as fulfillment centers, um, kind of staying flexible. Uh, other times we're talking about marketplaces, right? So I think a big part of this is that we need to recognize businesses all start at different places. There are different models that people are starting from. They have different strengths, different weaknesses. Um, so Sharon, I was wondering if you know, maybe you could help people understand, well, will this work for my business? What are the questions that they need to ask themselves? Um, up here on the slide, I have a few images of what some typical omni-channel models look like. So how should companies navigate the questions that they have? Yeah, we've done a lot of thinking about this. I love this question, Mario, because um, the omni-channel consulting team that we run essentially has thousands of conversations a year with merchants to help identify where are you now and how can you move up the curve of omni-channel maturity, right? What channels are you selling on now? What's your growth strategy on those channels? What new channels do you think you should be contemplating or adopting in order to be able to drive more growth for your business? Because every merchant says, how can I grow? How can I acquire new customers? And how can I do it uh, profitably, right? And the answer is very much based on what kind of merchant you are, 
are you a small merchant or an enterprise? Do you have a large catalog or a small one? Do you hold your own inventory? Uh, or do you use uh, dropship relationships or, or vendor partnerships in order to fulfill your products? Do you sell your own brand or do you sell multiple brands? These questions kind of create kind of a personality uh, that, that allows you to identify what your strengths and opportunities are that allow you to say, okay, um, I am a large brand who sells less than a thousand SKUs. The opportunities for me is really about partnership. Maybe I'm in a category that makes me a really good fit for social commerce. Or if you're a very, very large multi-brand retailer, maybe your strength is having a wide diversity of SKUs and assortment of SKUs that make you a really good fit for marketplaces or for search where you're commanding a lot of traffic because you have such good breadth uh, of the products that you're sending to Google Merchant Center that allows you to drive traffic back to your own direct-to-consumer. Um, these are the kinds of things you need to think about because the strategies that somebody, let's take a niche boutique, who might have five stores and what their strengths are is they're product experts. They're really good at how to wear, how to style, how to, uh, you know, they're, they're product category experts. And what they need to be investing in is how do we optimize our lifetime value and our shopper experience with the loyalists that we have who come into our store every week and then we continue a relationship with them digitally, maybe over social community channels, as an example. So when you're identifying your omni-channel strategy. You have to know who you are first as a brand and who are your shoppers and where are they? Are you, are you curating large communities of social, uh, you know, social loyalists because you have great influencer relationships? That's an example of something where you might be investing in high ROAS and high return on investment, new uh, social commerce channels. Whereas if you have um, really strong CPG foothold and relationships with uh, marketplaces where you already have products that are being fulfilled with Amazon FBA, you might be contemplating things like Amazon buy with prime on your direct to consumer it, um, or expanding channels to things like target plus. If you are real, if you already have a lot of strength around marketplace operations, cause you're already selling on multiple global marketplaces, you might be thinking about expanding globally that way to other marketplaces in different regions. So I think these are the things that we need to think about, which, which is, what kind of brand are you? Where are your strengths? And how can you lean into that when you contemplate your channel expansion strategy? Because channel expansion might mean going from D to C to offering a B to B experience, or it might mean expanding across and getting sending better quality data to your ads channels to drive more traffic to your high value, high margin owned direct to consumer experiences. Or it might mean investing really significantly in your omni-channel shopper journey to make sure you're gathering all that first party data that you can feed back into a remarketing experience across your direct to consumer and owned uh, you know, uh, text-based or S uh, text SMS messaging email kind of channels. So those are the kind of use cases we think about when you're evaluating your strategy because it's not the same strategy for everybody. It's who are you and then what kind of omni-channel strategy you need and then what kind of technology and tools should you invest in in order to do execute the strategy that's right for the kind of merchant you are. Thank you, Sharon. Um, yes, I think there's definitely a, a sort of growth curve, right? Maturity stages. So, you know, Luke, I mean, the way we're talking about this, it sounds accessible to everybody, but is omni-channel for everyone? Or how should a business approach this? You know, maybe what are the building blocks or when can you approach this? Sure. Um, you know, I'd say one, it, it depends on your definition of omnichannel again. If we're really focused on that front end selling component and you're asking yourself, where could I be extending beyond my own dot com or my own brick and mortar, uh, you know, sites to be marketplaces, social platforms, digital native ads, other touch points. I think everyone should be considering that and asking those questions. So is omnichannel in that realm for everyone with some exceptions, which we can get into I'd say, yeah, think about it, especially when you have technology and service providers like Feedonomics who can guide and carry that lift on your behalf. Again, it goes back to what Sharon was saying, though, with, you know, what's written on Apollo's temple in Delphi, know thyself, you know, the, the greatest, uh, you know, advice that any of us can take professionally, personally, you know, or with our businesses is to know ourselves. And so obviously looking at this slide on the right half, if you don't have multiple locations of inventory, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Don't add multiple locations of inventory just to be able to say, I'm doing Omni. Add it for the other right reasons. Do Omni by unifying it, making it efficient. Similar with brick and mortar. If you're only a digital-based company, you're not going to be doing buy online, pick up, and store. However, keep an open mind on that horizon because we're seeing some really cool brands do really cool, innovative things as we're entering you know, 2023, or we've been seeing this past year. Brands that are even exploring with no inventory storefronts, that there's an, you know, a small shop experience where you can 
try on some sizes or touch and feel the products, but it's actually, there's no inventory for you to take home. You buy, you buy in store and it ships to your home. And this allows an endless aisle of never running out of inventory. Um, and so is Omni for you? I'd say, ask that question, consider it, think outside of the box in those realms. Um, but definitely understand if you even have the infrastructure when, you know, from the, the enterprise background that I'm coming from of, you know, affording, you know, huge pieces of technology to do this mapping and this integration between the infrastructure points that you might not have today, which is fine. So start where you need to start. Um, but if you have the right components of a, and a fortified brand strategy, should, you should at the very least be exploring omnichannel options for your business. But start with research, start with analysis, a holistic view about what that means for every corner of your business operations. Because omnichannel means all, it's going to affect all of your business from development and IT to customer care, merchandising experts, buyers, social media managers, in-store employees. You know, if you are of the type of, uh, you know, headcount caliber right now where you could hire a GM to lead an omnichannel strategy, find someone with that experience if you're at that enterprise level. Um, if, you know, if not, maybe you're just trying to dip your toe in, um, you know, look for a consultant agency or a system integrator, or, I mean, Sharon even mentioned big commerce as an omnichannel consulting team, right? Talk to experts in this space that can help you know yourself, run those types of analyses, and ultimately seek out technology and service providers like Feedonomics who can run proof of concept analyses for you, bring a consultant mindset into practice in that relationship. So those would be my first steps is, Think critically about where you are. Be open to it. If you're on this call today, chances are there's an application um, for you, but be very thoughtful because you can't just rush into um, efficiency, right? It has to be done uh, tactfully and intentionally. I think that's a great point, Luke. Um, we don't want to talk about omni-channel as a goal. We want to talk about it as a means to an end. So what's the application that you wish to achieve? What's the function that you want to enable? Not just I want to be cool. I want to have omni-channel. Um, and so to kind of help you do that, um, Madison has mentioned it. We created this guide. Sharon was a contributor. Luke was a contributor. We also have a bunch of other industry experts from um, Amazon, Rise Interactive, Tika Metrics. Um, a lot of our partners helped us put together what we consider the 29 key considerations for adopting an omni-channel strategy. Uh, so it's going to help you sort of think about things in the right way, right? We're talking about understanding your customer, choosing the right channels, optimizing data, retaining your customers, investing in human talent, and scaling your business. Um, so Sharon, uh, I guess what I would like to get into with you is maybe one of these key points from our experts, which is ensuring that businesses understand their customers and use data to make things more personalized. Yeah, I think first off, I'd love to, that last slide that you were on Mario, I think is really interesting because I, for those who are on the webinar, I would like to understand which area of this is the most interesting to you. So Mario, just go back one slide just for a second. Um, we have an opportunity for you to put questions in the chat. If you have a question on any one of these things, we would like to tailor what we're talking about to, in order to address the things you're interested in. So if you have a question around I don't know how to understand my customer or how do I start, or I'm this kind of merchant. What are the channels that you guys have seen from a benchmark growth perspective that's delivering outsized results? Um, or if you're contemplating, how do you manage your data strategy? Put your questions in the Q&A. We really want to be able to address and make this relevant based on the sets of, I guarantee everybody on this call has a problem <laughs> that you're trying to solve. And it might be, we're, we're, in, we're entering recession. What's the way to make sure that I'm future-proofing um, you know, and delivering recession proofed recommendations to my customers if you're an agency or um, working if you're on the merchant side. I'd love to understand what the biggest problems you guys are seeing are. So toss those into the chat so that we can address them. And then let me let me pop back to your question on the next slide, Mario. So one of the question was, how do you know um, who your customers are? How do you how do you find them? How do we prioritize that? And so I think one of the things you have to understand is what are the trends around where customers are originating their search? for your products or products uh, or services that you deliver. And so if 91% of consumers are more likely to shop from brands that recognize and remember and provide offer relevant recommendations, we need to be offering those relevant recommendations in the channels that somebody is searching. So understanding um, 
what your who is buying from you by looking having a good understanding of your analytics and who your most loyal customers are, who delivers you the most lifetime value, and then identifying where you can acquire more of those kind of people in the channel is really critical, right? And so if you are in the categories of apparel, accessories, home goods, health and beauty, if you are not contemplating a social commerce, like a, you know, kind of a phalanx social commerce strategy across Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and, you know, just in, to some extent, depending on the, the target, Snapchat and Pinterest, if you're in the U.S., I would hazard that you probably should start to contemplate it because these are the challenge. These are the channels that we are starting to see outsized return on investment in because of the, um, because what's happened obviously with the iOS uh, changes and the, and the focus on privacy regulation, which we all think is important is um, as we enter this kind of new era of um, let's call it consent based marketing for personalized experiences. Many, many, many consumers are willing to provide data in exchange for personalized experiences. This is this is the case. And so product platforms are working really hard to have the data handshake exist that is um, based on what consent the merchant and the customer have agreed on in terms of delivering a personalized experience. And so as you're evaluating these channels that you're thinking through, making sure that you are delivering, using the data that is available to you to deliver them an experience that they're looking for is critical. And that includes everything from making sure that the catalog that you have is optimized for the channel that's receiving it. So I'll give you an example. If you are, product, if you are tagging products on Instagram shopping, as an example, if Instagram or let's say TikTok doesn't know that the product that you're uploading to their, to their merchant center, uh, you know, that manages their commerce um, listings is a red, a red pair of shoes. It's not categorized as shoes. It's not in red and it's not women's size 10. Then they don't know to surface it when somebody is looking at another pair of red shoes or another pair of size 10 shoes. And so making sure that your product data is optimized based on what information you know about their customers that they're looking for on the channels they're looking for it on is really critical. It's like not merchandising your storefront uh, according to the things that most of the people are, are seeing, touching, and, and enjoying, right? It's about how do we how do we optimize the merchandising through product data on our digital channels in the same way that we optimize and merchandise the products uh, to be the things that most people who are coming to the storefront are looking for uh, in physical channels. Thank you, Sharon. Um, sure. Yeah, data is definitely the key to personalization. Um, we collect it, test it, uh, optimize it. So Luke, something we heard from a lot of our industry experts was that you need to find a balance between expanding and not overextending, right? So uh, what should companies keep in mind when they're looking at new channels, such as you know adding a new marketplace? Yeah, so I, I said my OG background was in advertising strategy, so I'll put on that hat for a second. The four P's of marketing, for those who might remember this, um, are product, price, promotion, and place. And all of that within the understanding of your consumer's personas. So when analyzing front-end multi-channel expansion, expansion, I recommend adopting first a marketing and a brand lens, because not all channels are right for every business or brand story. Each specific channel uh, has to be the right place for you and the persona that you're looking to reach. And Sharon was, was speaking to this. So here's an example, an outlier example, of course, but maybe you pride yourself, your brand in being ex absolutely exclusive. You can only be found in your own store locations or on your own website. Exclusivity is a value and an identifier of your brand. So maybe selling across Walmart and Amazon aren't the right call for you because you lose that perception of exclusivity. But maybe enabling direct selling from posts on your brand-owned Instagram account could be the right fit. So again, goes back to know yourself, know who you are as a brand. A few more quick hits here. Um, so number one, is the channel in mind a fit for my brand story, which is what I just spoke to? Number two, is the channel one where my consumers would expect or be delighted to find me? So Sharon was speaking you know, about um, search being a place of intent when they are um, maybe intentionally looking for something or something you offer, or is it going to be the right place where they're pleasantly surprised that there's exactly what they were looking for, even though they wouldn't have been able to call it to mind otherwise. Number three, will my price and promoting strategy fit this channel? Um, because different places you're selling might require variations in that, and will it then be profitable? And number four, am I prepared to be able to maintain and optimize the selling operations and customer service operations if I add this channel? 
Can I keep up with it? Will I make the most out of it? I get, you know, going back to the stat that was on that slide um, that, that Sharon read off, 91% of customers are more likely to shop from brands that recognize, remember, and provide relevant offers and recommendations. If you're going to add another channel, are you just adding it to have another place you are, or are you viewing it as an extension of your consistent experience into new channels? So if you're not prepared to unify the data and customer experience from channel to channel, touch point to touch point, you'll ultimately lose out on the value of the omni-channel strategy. So think about it intentionally, think about it, what it means for your brand, take it back to price promotion product as well. Um, and, you know, make sure that you're prepared to, to make the most out of it. Don't bite off more than you can chew at once. Um, you know, you need to be tactful and intentional, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Luke. Um, Sharon, you touched on this a little bit before when you were talking about product data on different channels. Um, so when you're deciding, you know, that you want to expand, you need to get your data ready. Uh, what are some things that people should keep in mind about product data when they start to create listings for different channels? Yeah, I think the, the really important thing to understand is that oftentimes people use their e-commerce catalog as the catalog that they just syndicate raw directly to the advertising channel, right? Like, oh, this free integration between uh, this e-commerce platform and that just takes the data in my e-commerce platform and sends it over. The issue is it's not optimized for the destination channel. The way that you put a product on your direct-to-consumer site is how you merchandise it for D2C. It's not how you optimize it for a for a advertising channel. So let me give you an example. Let's just talk about like title or product description. The way you might just uh, a title on your ecom, if you're on the branded.com, you're probably not going to have the brand name in the title of every single product that you're in because I know that it's this brand's products. So I'm on their website. The issue is if you don't include the title, like nouns, right? If you don't in include the brand name, the size, the color and the description of what it is in the title when you send it to Google, it's not going to show up in search results very well, in addition to being able to categorize it according to the, to the destination you know, product attribute schema that that channel needs. And so what has to happen is there's kind of an optimization process that needs to happen in the middle, which is why we acquired Feedonomics. It's because enterprise merchants who have thousands or millions of SKUs that they need to send to these channels with quality catalog data product, inventory, pricing, uh, is it a, you know, is this for a certain gender? Is it categorized according to the Google categorization, categorization schema or the Amazon one, which is even more complicated? This is what you need to consider in order to drive organic performance. Because what we're trying to do is we're feeding the algorithms on the channels, it's fruits and vegetables in order to deliver quality organic traffic. And if we deliver quality organic results, it's the number one way to drive ROAS for your paid search results. So if you're putting dollars behind promoted listings uh, with advertising spend, if you're doing so with bad um, non-categorized products with bad catalog data, the results that you get back are going to be worse. And so you need to have good data in to get good results out, which and in results, that means organic traffic or better return on your advertising spend on ads channels. On third-party marketplaces where the conversion is actually happening on the channel, it's actually about driving more uh, conversion, like more, more sales on that channel, because that's what those channels are using to drive their uh, search and merchandising algorithms that actually drive performance for, for merchants on those channels. And these, these platforms are extremely motivated to deliver the best results for the shopper. And if so, so optimizing your product catalog to be able to be performant on third-party channels is like the best thing that we can do besides allow helping power, uh, you know, a, a beautifully branded uh, direct-to-consumer storefront as an e-commerce platform. We need to be able to make sure that our merchants can easily and seamlessly sell anywhere they want to sell with quality catalog data. Um, and so we've kind of outlined some of the problems um, with this, which is it can be really challenging to make sure that you're managing thousands of SKUs to these channels and then managing and resolving the errors when those channels come back with a listing error in order to make sure that you're driving conversion. Um, and obviously that's why Feedonomics does this better than most in uh, it, it's the leading enterprise feeds, uh, you know, feed and channel management um, platform. And, and so certainly we, we have found this across a wide variety of channels, whether it's sending catalogs to ads to drive traffic uh, and drive better ROAS, or whether it's sending that catalog data to marketplaces to drive conversion. Yes, um, at Feedonomics, we view data optimization almost as a form of future-proofing your listings, future-proofing your business, because um, there's almost a misconception about 
automated campaigns and performance max and things like that, uh, that the data is less important, but it's actually more important now because it's all being driven by data. Um, what you put in is what you get out. Uh, we also see that like when you are talking about just getting your products listed for the first time, we're talking about, you know, what are the requirements? Well, each channel has different requirements, right? But in addition to that, there are recommended attributes, optional attributes. So when you have a high attribute fill rate, you're putting yourself in a position where if what was once a recommended attribute becomes a required attribute, you don't have to scramble to your developers to say, I need to create a new feed with uh, you know, new values coming out of it. I need new export schema, or I'm doing this manually. And suddenly I'm like dealing with revenue risk because I don't have anything listed and selling anymore. Um, so Luke, I wanna talk a little more about data because uh, one of the reasons that this is important is as I said, it's not just getting started, but it's this continuous cycle. Um, of course, you need to meet the requirements. You want to set yourself up to maximize your potential. But then it even goes beyond that when you talk about orders, inventory, um, and other details that are data driven. So, what's the cost of not maintaining high quality data across all of your online and offline systems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, data is power, right? And not maintaining the right appropriate data on your customers and orders reduces the potential power of your marketing, your remarketing, your upsell opportunities. So the first cost is the loss of opportunity if you're not collecting and having a plan to optimize, to use, to measure that data. The second cost of not maintaining high quality data is the operational inefficiency loss. If you're having to cancel orders because turns out the inventory wasn't really available after all, if inventory is sitting stagnant in warehouses or store shelves because it isn't being exposed or optimized across selling channels and you know proper smart fulfillment routing, if your customer service team is having to log into six to 10 different platforms just to find and service a single order, that's wasted time, energy, and profit margins. The third potential loss uh, is compliance. So, hey, did you know that there's more than 15,000 taxing jurisdictions in the U.S. alone? And your business's nexus and tax collection obligations might change overnight as you adopt and expand your omnichannel strategy because different states tax differently. For example, some states determine tax rates based off of where a shipment is being shipped from versus where it's being shipped to. Or have you ever noticed when you're in a cart checking out, the tax rate, if you select, you know, pick up and store is different than if it's shipping to your home. That's because a few miles or a few streets can make a big difference in those rates. So this gets extremely complex, and this is just one example, but you can imagine, especially when you need real-time calculation and, and a tax quote in the checkout process, and even perhaps more importantly, accurate data and collection to file your business's tax returns. So your business is on the hook for paying the correct taxation amount to the government, even if you didn't collect it properly. And that could mean hundreds of thousands of dollars of loss there. So there's risk mitigation here. Uh, and not only does a tax automation suite like Avalara provide real-time accurate tax rate calculation, but it serves in a similar way. We're talking about collecting this data, the centralization of all the indirect tax collections and exemptions across all your sales channels and selling channels for accurate tax returns. Actually, our integration with big commerce and by extension with Feedonomics is already omni-ready, able to capture and understand the specific channel of the sale. Because oftentimes, a marketplace you're selling through might be the one collecting the indirect tax on your behalf, but you still have to report that. So I'll, I'll get off the tax soapbox here. I am wearing orange today, but it's worth repeating, not collecting and centralizing high quality data can even have compliance and risk mitigation. And then the, the final quick thing is the fourth cost of not maintaining centralized data is a poor customer experience. That lack of personalization, which Sharon has been touching on you know, wonderfully here. Sudden order cancellations, inability to find in-stock items, delays in shipping, frustration and not being able to buy online to pick up in store when there's a store two miles away, or the reverse, not being able to return something in store or online, depending on where you bought it. All this creates customer experience friction and runs the risk of lost sales and even worse, lost loyalty. Thank you, Luke. Um, I, for one, always love talking about taxes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Good. Um, so, Luke, uh, a big thing you hit on in the guide, you know, and part of the contributions that you made um, was like looking beyond the life 
cycle of a sale, right? So we're thinking about omnichannel in terms of this sort of ongoing process if you're doing it correctly. Um, so that includes post-purchase considerations, investment in people behind the technology. And how should all of these details figure into a business's omnichannel strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say, you know, thinking about the full life cycle um, of an order that doesn't just end when you click purchase or check out or pay now. It's a full cycle, which could include all the way going through a return or an exchange, or if you're combining this with marketing or remarketing, future product recommendations, when you would or wouldn't send, you know, a request for them to submit a review, et cetera. So the total Omni experience includes the transparency in the, the consumer's wait time, the delivery process, um, when they're unboxing that experience or going through troubleshooting, when they need help setting up. Think about Omnichannel, not just, you know, again, ex constantly expanding this definition of all, turning it more to a brand experience. See it through the lens of, are you delivering a consistent winning culture of amazement experience to your customers, no matter where, or when they're trying to get information from you or be delighted to have that. And that can include offline components like I've unboxed and here's a great setup sheet that's really clear for me. It could include self-help online components or easy paths to customer service, et cetera. Really you need to be thinking about not just extending where you're going to sell, but how you're going to continue to support, amaze, and delight those customers all the way through it. Second component there is data, data, data. We just hit on this, but how you're sharing and using data with all of your teams, because it could impact how your sales team is, um, or marketing team is going about upsell opportunities or remarketing optimization for customer communication, smarter, more cost-effective investments and in how you capture data and how you're empowering your teams to use it. And then finally, you, you hit on this one, so I to make sure I address it. As you're investing in technology and these strategies, you must be investing in your people because your employees and teams must be prepared to use this technology. You can buy the shiniest piece of technology on the block, but if you don't have a path to make sure that it's going to be properly adopted for employees and easily adapted as you're hiring new employees, perhaps even week by week, that's going to be a big obstacle in the long run to value your investment. So make sure you have a path for adoption of this technology, for use of the data, and this all-encompassing culture vision to be able to think about how are we bringing our promise in all and every interaction. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, the human component is definitely not to be forgotten. Um, that being said, let's talk a little bit about the tech solutions here. So um, you can see here that we have sort of this web of what we consider critical pieces of an omni-channel tech stack, right? Um, whether you're trying to do this with like partners who specialize in things, uh, Feedonomics with data catalog management, feed management, Avalara with taxes, uh, BigCommerce as an e-commerce platform that sort of links everything together. Um, you have the option to lean on service providers to make sure you have everything covered. So Sharon, uh, you can see this visual here. Um, in the guide, you talk about the need for a robust partner network. So from your perspective, why is that so important? You need optionality. So we talked about how merchants aren't all created equal. If you expect to be able to get the best rates from your payment provider and from your 3PL shipping provider and your e-commerce platform and your best syndication capability without being able to use best of breed partners in the ecosystem, you're probably fooling yourself. In order to have an open, like big commerce's entire ethos is open commerce, right? We're not trying to have you use all of our solutions as an example. For example, merchants can use Feedonomics on other e-commerce platforms. You don't have to be on big commerce in order to utilize Feedonomics's leading syndication capabilities that can pull, you know, that can link data directly from your ERP or your PIM directly to those sales channels. So in this, in this philosophy of open commerce. If you want to be able to have the best of breed solution stack for your business and the optionality that you need, I've been working with CTOs for, for over 15 years to help them put together their solution stack that they need in order to be able to power the experiences they want to deliver. Um, and it and oftentimes they come to the table with technology they already have. Maybe they already have a data warehouse and a business intelligence tool uh, you know, and suite that they're pulling all of the information from. We want to make it as easy as possible to do that. And so making sure that you're choosing partners that have pre-existing integrations 
that are leaned into this kind of mock alliance or composable open approach allows you to create a best of breed solution architecture that meets the needs you have, as opposed to uh, kind of a suite that's dictated for you from payments to POS, right? So you'll want to be able to understand the components of your business that serve your needs, whether it's what is your system of record? Oftentimes, you know, you're not replatforming your ERP all the time. That's that's a very permanent system of record that often you come to the table with when you're evaluating different partners and say, how can you integrate into my ERP? Um, when you're evaluating your e-commerce platform, does it support all of the use cases you have? Multi-storefront, multi-channel, omni-channel support. Does it get the data out of the system and put it into the tools that you already use? When you're evaluating feed management solutions, does it have the optionality to integrate into API-based channels as well as to provide CSV files to, you know, kind of the second and third tier marketplaces that might not have the API infrastructure required. These are the things that you need to contemplate when you're evaluating what channels you should be on and how do you get your data, catalog, inventory, and orders to sync seamlessly from the places you hold your inventory, whether it's a third-party logistics provider that you've loved working with for a really long time, or maybe you just added another 3PL partner in uh, Europe, as an example, because you're expanding you know, regionally, these are the things that you need to be contemplating. Where do you wanna sell? How do you wanna fulfill? And what partners do you need to provide the best experience for your shoppers in order to be able to deliver that? Thank you, Sharon. Um, I see that we have a few questions here in the Q&A and I do wanna leave some time to get to these. Uh, let's see here. So Sharon and Luke, are you able to see these questions here? Yeah, I love uh, I love some of the questions that we have here. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, with this one. Um, so I love questions about highly regulated industries. The, these are the tricky ones. So thanks for starting us off with a super tricky question around a digital smoke shop, Brennan. So for Brennan, I have a website that's a digital smoke shop. Traditional advertisers such as Google and others, and many don't allow uh, advertising. What channel should I be using? I love this question because you're totally right. Regulated products. Um, the 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 acquisition strategies for highly regulated products are very different than the acquisition strategies for those who can list their products on Google or Facebook or Instagram or others. Um, so regulated products are exciting because the focus for acquisition really has to be on organic search as well as if you have, so you said digital smoke shop. Many uh, have physical locations and what they do is they acquire customer information as soon as somebody comes into the store and then they pivot them to loyalty focused channels. And so it, when you're doing it digitally, you have to be making sure that you are optimizing all of your search engine optimization data that can that when somebody has a directed search for that product, the search engines will surface it because they have literally typed in the words saying, I'm looking for this thing. You're not allowed to buy ads, but you're certainly allowed to provide organic um, information that drives organic traffic. And so focusing on SEO and then pushing heavily into cross-promoting loyalty channels that are not regulated, such as email and SMS, uh, or rather not regulated in the same way around advertising rules, is a really, really good way to drive loyalty. Because those who um, focus and buy from you, the focus on the strategy should really be about acquisition via organic SEO, pushing very heavily towards uh, loyalty-based remarketing campaigns to those who have bought once from you, have them buy from you again, as an example. Hopefully that answered the question. If there's a clarification, feel free to follow up. Um, another question that we have here is around TikTok. So I'll jump into that one. And then I think Luke, there's another question here for you specifically. Um, so what are the thoughts on you utilizing TikTok for growing an e-commerce business? And have we any, seen any, any success stories? The answer is absolutely yes. I'll give you an example. People are spending on average 88 minutes a day on TikTok. And it's not just Gen Z, right? There, there is a wide, 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 wide range. Like TikTok got to a billion users faster than uh, any other social commerce platform has. And COVID certainly helped with that. But a lot of it is, you know, this kind of origination of vertical video and snackable video content that, that gets you very, very, very close to either a brand or a celebrity or an influencer or a personality who's entertaining you. And so what's interesting about the format of that vertical video is that we have seen a lot of opportunity for either brands who have invested in the capability to tell their, their story or the um, or the, the maker story about the products that they have. If you are originating the content, you have product experts who can be articulating why uh, this brand exists and aligning 
uh, with collaborators who share the same ethos in order to build an interesting community. And it's very entertainment based. You can't just take a, you know, a video that you create on a different channel and put it on TikTok. You have to make TikToks, right? The kind of kitschy transitions that exist in this, in this channel are very unique and very different. And so you either have to invest in, in that as a way to drive that. So as an example, I, um, I mentioned, a. Uh, a boutique on big commerce who was able to invest and connect in sending their catalog to TikTok and then created um, you know, seasonal based campaigns on how to wear certain products in order to drive traffic to their direct to consumer that we saw very significant results from. And we can share some of the case studies there as well. Um, but whether it's you're taking on that work to create that those kind of um, you know, viral video assets yourself or whether you're collaborating with influencers, we've seen a lot of different strategies for brands and retailers to invest in new channels such as TikTok in order to drive kind of outsized return on investment for, for new channel adoption where there are very significant, uh, you know, an audience the size of a Super Bowl commercial uh, kind of at your fingertips. So that's the short answer. Luke, I see another question here. Yeah, I, I love tax questions. So thank you. Uh, the question is, how is Boost tax ordered online from another state? So uh, short answer is very meticulously and carefully. Um, and the complications there don't just end with the tax rates. The different license registrations by state and jurisdiction just exponentializes in complexity when you're shipping alcohol. And the compliance rules of every state has different rules on how much or what percentage uh, you know, alcohol volume can be sent to an individual in a given time. So Avalara actually does have an av uh, alcohol and beverage product that automates all of that. Um, so if that's of interest to you, please look it up or hit me up offline, happy to talk about it. But yeah, another example of the complexities uh, that, that come and go um, as you're going cross state um, or you know, omni, you know, even if it's gonna be uh, picked up at a winery, you know, there, there's definitely um, examples of, of those implications there as well. We have time for another one, right? I see a couple yeah. amazing questions around CPG for K, uh, from Katie here. One of the questions, what are your thoughts on um, how would a CPG company approach omnichannel given that DTC models are not adopted and they rely heavily on retail partners to sell? Um, I love this question because what's really interesting is in this omnichannel world, shoppers don't need to go to a direct to consumer. So let me give you an example that relates to our TikTok example. Let's imagine that you are a CPG. Uh, so Big Commerce powers over 80 sites from one CPG holding company that um, that I'm, I'm sure you can imagine who they are. Uh, we what you can, can can do is number one, you can consider launching sites uh, or social experiences where you send your catalog to those social experiences. Let's say TikTok for an example, where you're actually driving traffic from that TikTok experience or that Instagram checkout experience or that Snap experience, depending on what channel suits your overlap of user the most. And then driving that traffic to a to a place where you have listed your products on third party marketplaces. So you can either drive that ad traffic directly to a product detail page on Target Plus, for example, if you are listing your products on Target Plus. Um, another example would be, let's say for example, you're a CPG who has huge numbers of your SKUs in Amazon by uh, Amazon FBA uh, fulfillment centers. With the new release in partnership with Big Commerce and Amazon Buy with Prime, you can have a direct to consumer site. Let's say, for example, it's not it's not a very significant driver of your of your traffic. But what you can now do is in that owned experience where you articulate the value of that product that you're selling, you can actually have a buy like a buy with Prime button right on there that that fulfills that product directly from your Amazon FBA warehouse uh, um, inventory. And so that's an example where CPGs are really interested because it's marrying up the relationship they have with their third party marketplace, either um, digital experience or in-store experience where they're driving traffic to, to a place where they already have a relationship with, with distributors that can surface, oh, I see that that product is available near me, available to be delivered by XYZ date. Uh, so this is an example of how CPG can take advantage of omni-channel strategy, either investing in wherever those traffic areas are and then driving it to the point of conversion that, that yields you the most value based on your unit, unit economics. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I do see we have one more question in the chat. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to wrap it up here, but I do want to leave you with this. If you have any other questions, there is a very good chance that you will find the answers you're looking for in this guide. Um, you'll find, I mean, this is just like scratching the surface, I swear. Uh, and we have a bunch of other experts who also contributed all sorts of perspectives on various stages of the things that we showed you previously. 
Um, we'll be sending that out tomorrow. We'll also be sending out a recording of this webinar. So thank you everybody for coming. We love the questions. Love that you lent us your attention. Um, please look forward to that guide. And thank you to Sharon and Luke as well. I, I'm just constantly blown away by how many bits of information you store in your head and produce on the regular. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us here, Mario. Thank you.